And it's that other cultural st other stream I mentioned earlier. It's the culture, it's what they're learning. So the young sperm whale is in this social unit with her mom and her aunts and so on. And she's learning from them how to communicate, how to move and so on. And that's their culture. So we've got these clans with different cultures, but using the same waters. And that's a, a, a really unusual case because, you know, for instance, chimpanzee groups have different cultures, but they live in different places, they're, they're, you know, territorial. So it means it's hard to distinguish which, whether the culture is due to the different environments or due to them learning as different stuff from each other. But with the sperm whales, because they're in the same area, we know that it's culture. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a, it was a wonderful moment when we found that. And it's been, you know, really great as we've discovered more and more about that system. Welcome to Animalia, where we cover all things conservation, climate justice, and sustainability. In recent years, there has been increased evidence of the existence of powerful subcultures existing within wild species. Culture, in its simplest form, is how we socially learn behaviors and norms from others around us. So in some ways, it should not be surprising that culture exists amongst non-human species, given how social and inter... So in some ways, it should not be surprising that culture exists amongst non-human species, given how social and interconnected animals are. What is special and unique and what is changing conservation science is just how distinctive and uniquely valuable subcultures are, as they are with humans. For a long time, we viewed non-human species as genetically wired, meaning they're coded with the behaviors to hunt or forage, to run or stand ground, and so forth via their genes. And while it's true that many foundational behaviors and traits are indeed genetically provided, so too are ones driven by social culture. Today, we sit down with Hal Whitehead, who has spent decades at sea studying whales and dolphins. In particular, he specializes in sperm whales. What he has noticed is that groups of sperm whales with the same genetics living in the same conditions exhibit vastly different styles of hunting, of ceremony, of raising young, and of course, of language and dialect. Distinct language is something that we have long thought only exists in human subcultures, but that is not the case. After discussing the cultural identifiers in sperm whales, Hal and I discuss how this is changing conservation science, how it can no longer just be about saving and protecting an overall species, but the actual subcultures within it. Hal has also given an amazing TED Talk on this topic, which we'll link to in the description. Yeah, okay, my name's Hal Whitehead, and I, I spend most of my time trying to study the behavior, the culture, the social systems, and the conservation of, of deep water whales. But I, I, I have a lot of interest in, in other animals, whales and other creatures. I, I spend quite a bit of time at sea. I have a 40-foot sailing boat, and we go out for periods of two to three weeks and follow whales around try and figure out what they're up to. And I'm also originally a mathematician, so I do quite a lot of work on how to analyze the kind of data that field biologists get and how to make sense of it. Yeah, so that's that's what I do. <laughs> how many, uh, roughly on an annual basis, how many days a year do you spend at sea? Um, I think I spend about, <clears throat> on average, about six weeks. Something like that. Every year. Some yeah. some years are it's good, a lot more than that. And, but last year I haven't been at sea on my boat for over a year. So yeah. Things haven't been good. <laughs> That's the do longest you, period in 40, 50 years. <laughs> so, do you feel yeah. do you feel more at home at sea or on land at home? <laughs> I think mostly at, at sea, but I, I I I've just moved into a house on the rock and and so, I mean, we're just on a cliff above above the ocean. So beyond you, as I look out, I see the ocean. Mm. That's lovely. That's nice. And actually, yeah. it's it's very close, just a, uh, you know, less than hundred yards away. So yeah, uh, and and you're in Nova Scotia, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, amazing. So I to start, 
includes included in all the body of work you've done has been work to study, you know, kind of cultural patterns in some of these deep water whale species. And I'm wondering if you can just for my listeners that don't kind of have this concept of 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 culture in non-human species to just kind of outline the difference between sort of the way I think of it is, you know, what a species does, which is sort of baseline genetically kind of coded in, but then how they do it might be more culturally learned and how, you know, different groups of the same species in the same location can do certain tasks very differently from each other based on culture. And I wonder if you can just kind of help outline the difference between that kind of genetic, you know, inclined behavior and the, and the cult, culturally learned behavior. Okay. Yeah. Well, so the way I and basically all zoologists de- de- define behavior is that it, it, it de- define culture is it's socially learned information or behavior, and that it's characteristic of a group. So socially learned means you learn it because you're with somebody else, and you know that can be very simple, like you fucked up following your mom around so you find different things that you wouldn't have found if you weren't following her around. Or it can be very complicated, like, you know, reading the manual for how to build a space shuttle or, you know, imitating a great tennis player or or something like that. So that's all culture and that's all social learning and it can form culture. So by that definition, culture includes very complicated things or like the complicated songs of nightingales and uh, humpback whales and high opera. But it also includes pretty simple stuff like which side of the road we drive on and how we how we greet each other or how killer whales greet each other. Because in each case, they're learning it from each other. So you can, so from an evolutionary biologist's point of view, culture is another way that animals get to be like each other that things are inherited. So you do certain things, I do certain things, I look a certain way because of my parents, but I do, I look and do other things because of the, my culture, what I've learned from others. It could be from my parents, but it could be from others. So there, there are these two streams running through a cultural population, the genetic stream and the cultural stream. And they have some similarities because, again, you can learn from your parents like you get your genes, but they have some differences because you can learn from your peers, you can learn from the internet, and so on. And and the two streams can affect one another. So, and it's particularly interesting when the cultural stream affects the genetic stream. And in other words, the way we do things leads certain genes to be favored or disfavored. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people sort of have this notion that, you know, culture is unique to humans, that we have culture and, you know, non-humans just behave instinctively, but that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. And it, and it, and, 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 you know, even from the, you know, kind of very simple species all the way up to very complex species like whales, like elephants, there seems to be evidence that I've seen of culture in, in such a, a variety of, of creatures and, and species. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, it was, culture was seen as, as one of those dividing hu- lines between humans and, the, and others. And there have been all kinds of these dividing lines, and they've all sort of crumbled away as we've learned more about other animals. That there's very little that we can do that they can't do, at least in, in some form. And, and culture is definitely one of them. I mean, the, w- when I started getting interested in this in the say mid late 1990s, there was certainly a feeling that, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of culture outside humans, but it's pretty primitive and unimportant. Hmm. And then the ideas expanded. We found for some species, such as for chimpanzees and elephants and and, and some whales, culture is vital to them. So a whale, uh, well, a sperm whale, like the ones I study, wouldn't be a sperm whale without what she has learned from other, other sperm whales. Just as uh, a human wouldn't be able to exist without what we've learned from each other. If you took a human, raised it by itself, and stuck it out, even in the most productive areas, mm-hmm. you know, we were, they wouldn't survive. So 
culture is, you know, for some, these sort of species, it's vital. But even for, as you said, for, 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 for what we think of as quite simple species with quite small brains like bees or rats, yeah, they're learning from each other. And some of the stuff they're learning from each other is pretty important. From the moment this interview was set up, I was excited to ask Hal about sperm whales. They've always been a fascinating creature for me. Made famous, of course, by Moby Dick. Sperm whales are not as commonly observed as orcas or humpbacks, for example, because of how far offshore they live and how little time they spend near the surface. They dive extraordinarily deep for their food, spending most of their time in the dark, yet are one of the most social and communicative species of whales on the planet. Wondering for those that maybe are not so familiar with the sperm whale or, you know, many of us have never been able to see one in the wild. Can you kind of briefly describe the sort of magnificent magnificence of that animal yes, and, okay. and how it stands out to you? And then we'll get into some of the kind of cultural identifiers they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, sperm whales have been called the animal of extremes. They're extreme in all kinds of ways. So perhaps jointly with the killer whale, they have the biggest brains on Earth. They, they, they have the biggest noses on Earth. They make the most powerful sound of any animal. They... If you took all the sperm whales alive today and added up what they eat, it's about what all human fisheries with all our factory freezer trawlers and everything else managed to get out of the ocean. They are uh, the most distinct whale. So if you look at the evolutionary tree, their root is the longest before you join up with any other whale that's around. And, and there's all kinds of other weird stuff about them. Where, like uh, they have the greatest uh, segregation between the sexes of any species. The females are mainly in the tropics and subtropics. The males are mainly in the Arctic and subarctic waters. So uh, they're pretty, pretty extraordinary creatures. But they're also extremely social creatures. And that's the bit that really uh, grabs me. They live in the, in the deep waters. So they feed on deep water squid. So you have to get, a, in most places, a fair ways offshore to find them, unless uh, you're beside a volcanic island or on a volcanic island or something like that. You have to get off the continental shelf. So that's why most people haven't seen them. You know, they're quite a ways out, but they, they you know, once you get out there, that's their realm. And they are, you know, in some ways, dominant there. Hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> they the of all the time you spent with them, is there you know an anecdote that kind of sticks out uh, experience that's memorable for you in, in sort of being around them and, and studying them and learning from them? Okay, well th this is a slightly weird one, but it does that's stick perfect. out in my brain more than the other one. <laughs> there was a time off of northern Chile where we were following, as we do, a group of sperm whales around, and this was a very large group well, pretty large group, maybe 50, 60 animals. And they, as they do, came all, all, all came up to the surface. This happens often in the afternoon, we call it tea time, and they're socializing and resting and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and they were this day, and I looked at my close colleague, Luke Rendell, who, who was with me on board, and I said, do you have any idea what they're doing? And he said, no, and I said, Neither have I. And, uh, and here we are, we, between us, been studying sperm whales for 30 or 40 years. And this is, and we still had no idea what they were doing. Whereas the other ocean creatures, the birds, the seals, and so on out there, we had a fairly good idea, sharks, fairly good idea of what they were up to. So, I mean, there's a lot of mystery here. But then what happened was a seal, actually a fur seal, a sm which by sperm whale standards is pretty teeny. It's a, couple of meters long at best, came up and all these sperm whales were lined up. And the first seal came up in front of them and pivoted onto a vertical axis and then started pirouetting around, mm -hmm. um, you know, twisting about its axis. And then one of the sperm whales, many, many times bigger, started doing the same thing. So there's two animals, the little one, the big one, just pirouetting. Um, together. And uh, I, I, I guess that g gave me a feel both for, you know, their awareness, their sense of, of fun, and how important copying is to them. That, mm -hmm. you know, that here they go and do this with uh, a completely different creature. Anyway, that, that, that's a, 
stands out in my mind. That, that yeah. Idea. It sounds like quite quite the sight to see. <laughs> yeah. In terms of the cultural identifiers in sperm whales specifically, yeah. what are like how what's the process of for you of identifying the kind of sub dialects as sort of stamps of possible kind of cultural uh, groupings within the sperm whale community? Yeah, well, I- I- initially we didn't have any feel for this. We were listening to their sounds and their sounds by the standards of many other whales, pretty boring. They go click, 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 clickety click, click, click. So this wonderful nose they have that can make the power, most powerful sonar system, you know, sound on earth, their, their sonar, which they find these deep water squid with, is also used to make these communication sounds, but they put them in these patterns. And we, you know, we heard the, well, others had heard them before, and uh, we wondered what was going on here. And uh, we, you know, there were a couple of theories. One idea came from the studies of bottlenose dolphins, that these were signatures and they were names. But that wasn't, wasn't the case. We could fairly quickly show that um, two, one whale could make several different kinds of these, and, the you know, two whales could make the same kind. So the next idea was it was a kind of language, right? So that the clickety click, click, click means come and look after my baby or click, 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 click might mean let's all dive together. But that didn't seem to fit either with possibly some, some ex- a few, one or two exceptions. But what finally became clear was that it was related to the social structure and we looked at the repertoires of a bunch of uh, what we call social units, which are mainly family, basically <coughs> family groups, a bunch of females and they're young and so on. So about 10, 12 uh, sperm whales who spend all their time together, swimming around together. And they have repertoires of patterns of clicks. And in a major study area off the Galapagos, this was in about 2000, 2001, we found, we suddenly realized, we, we've been recording them for 15 years earlier, but we hadn't noticed this, that there were a bunch of these social units who had very similar patterns of clicks. And there was another bunch of sperm whales of, of social units with a very different pattern, whose di- very different patterns of clicks. So the first one tended to use them in a regular pattern. So click, 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 or click, 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 click. And the second one went more like this, click, 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 click. So we called them the regular and plus one. We called them clans. And uh, and then we found as we went into our data that the, although the different social units, they're very sociable, they, they not only within the social units, but they form groups with other social units. But the, these groups only contained members of a particular clan. So even though off the Galapagos there were regular social units and plus one social units, each group we found only had the regular or only had the plus one. And, uh, and, 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 and then we went to, and looked at different behavior patterns. And so we found that the two different clans behaved differently. So they moved in different ways. They used slightly different areas, although they did overlap and they, um, and, and they socialized in somewhat different ways. So, you know, we were wondering what was going on here. Were, were these subspecies or whatever? So luckily we could do the genetics because the sperm whales leave bits of skin at the surface as they swim along. So you can scoop them up and bring back to the uh, m- m- molecular uh, biologists and they can do all their uh, magic and find out relationships and and, and look at genes. And, and in, in the nuclear genes, the ones that actually you know, might control behavior, there's no difference between the clans. They're they're all mixed up. So something else is differing. And it's that other cultural, other stream I mentioned earlier, it's the culture, it's what they're learning. So the young sperm whale is in this social unit with her mom and her aunts and so on. And she's learning from them how to communicate, how to move and so on. And that's their culture. So we've got these clans with different cultures, but using the same waters. And that's a, a, a really 
unusual case because, you know, for instance, chimpanzee groups have different cultures, but they live in different places, they're, you know, territorial. So it means it's hard to distinguish which, whether the culture is due to the different environments or due to them learning different stuff from each other. But with the sperm whales, because they're in the same area, we know that it's culture. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a, it was a wonderful moment when we found that. And it's been, you know, really great as we've discovered more and more about that system. I mean, we found many clans in different parts of the world. It takes a long time for culture to change, but it does change. And it's usually younger generations kind of redefining it, reshaping it for themselves or people migrating different locations around the world and kind of forming new cultures that way. So how might culture change? We know that with humans, culture can both endure and iterate in equal parts. We have very short waves of culture that move a lot, such as a diet fad like juicing. And we have enduring long lasting norms such as religion, or even the fact that we all more or less accept that we have to wear clothing in public. It makes sense that such a system would then exist for sperm whales as well. Religions, well, maybe the, you know, in extremists, the Jewish religion mm. has lots of elements that have been stable for many, many generations, and our language is a fairly stable. I mean, English mm. is changed a little bit from when I was a kid, but it's it's it, you know, it's not that different. But we also have elements of our cultures which are highly unstable. So, for instance, fashion sense has changed yeah. dramatically over the years I've been alive. <laughs> and, and other things like, you know, boy bands have very short, you know, that's another form of culture, but it, it's, it comes and it goes. So, and we find the same with whales. So that there are elements of their cultures, and in particular, uh, for a species like sperm whales, the, the, these um, patterns of sounds are stable. And, you know, we've got recordings back 30, 40 years, and then pretty similar to the ones we hear now. But there are other aspects which vary transient. So for instance, the killer whales in, uh, of British Columbia and Washington state, one summer, one killer whale started pushing a dead salmon around. And that, that became the cool thing. Everyone had a dead salmon uh, by the end of that summer. And- uh, Just pushing, pushing it around? It. Yeah, yeah, that was it. You had a dead salmon, you pushed it around. That was, that was the thing, a uh, cool thing to do. And uh, but but you know by the end of the summer it wasn't cool anymore. No, nobody was doing it. I think one started out the next year, but yeah, it gave up. It, well, it wasn't done. Yet. So they have both these things. And if we go to sperm whales, we we haven't got as good information on their culture as the killer whale people do in that part of the world. But um, we do find, and most of our best information is from these uh, these recordings of their vocalizations. And, and we find that, the, you know, basically the patterns are pretty stable over decades, but there are changes. So there was one clan, the, the, the regular ones, the click, 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 who in the 1990s start increasing the length between their clicks. So they got about 30% longer, the, 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 pat, the coders, the patterns. So there is some evolution over time. And we... Uh, really don't have a good feel for, you know, how much there is and how it varies between different things. We know culture exists as, as evidence in your studies with whales. We know it exists with elephants and wolf packs, these very social animals. Have there been any signs or is there any reason yes. to believe there's culture in more of the solitary animals that aren't kind of spending a lot of time with that? Let's take sea turtles as an example, primarily solitary creatures for the from their birth all the way you know, to the end of their life. Does, does, does being social, is that a kind of necessary ingredient for culture? Well, as culture, culture is based on social learning, right? So, mm -hmm. so the learning has to be because of another <clears throat> animal. But, and so obviously the people make the assumption, reasonably make the assumption that you just spelled out that it, 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 it you would find it nearly always in these highly social animals, and you've, you've mentioned a few. But I think the best example of this is in orangutans. Now, orangutans aren't particularly social. By great age standards, they're not social, but they are a little bit. And they have 
you know, they've been studied pretty thoroughly and they have very clear culture. And, and, and so it seems that they, although they don't spend a lot of time with, with each other, when they are, they, they're aware, they're learning from each other, they're figuring things out. They learn from, them, obviously, their mothers, but there's also some learning for, for, from other orangutans. So I, I think that's the best known case. I mean, in, 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 of a, what is presumed to be a fairly solitary animal. In the case of the whales, we find in species which we don't think of as terribly social, like the minke whale, that because you usually, if you come across one, it's just one, not a group of two, three, four, five, six, that they have songs which uniform over a particular ocean area and different in another ocean area, which is strongly indicative of culture, that, that you know, that culture has led to this thing. And, and so these minke whales are learning their songs from each other, almost certainly. And, and I think here that the issue is more that our definition of so, social isn't their definition. They can hear each other, they're getting information from each other. And they could be a hundred miles apart and still, you know, being able to hear and communicate with each other. So I think when we say not social, we've got to think about it from the animal's terms, not so much our own. The big topic for today's discussion, how are social cultures within wild species changing conservation science? We are just in the beginning phases of this, but the impact is profound. Let's think about humans as an example. There's so much deep knowledge and experience wrapped up in different distinct subcultures. For example, even within this country, the United States, if, if we lost everyone and anyone who lives in the rural community and knows how to farm and grow food, and we were left with only sweaty, and we were left with only city dwellers who know how to, I don't know, create advertising and set economic policy. And we were left with only city dwellers who say know how to create advertising and run a bank, we'd be in a pickle in terms of getting food. As we'll see in an example with Hal, if we lost all the whales that live in a particular part of the ocean and know the ins and outs of how to find food and survive predators there, and then another group is forced to the same waters due to climate change, well, that new group would have a hard time surviving without the legacy group to learn from. Protecting subcultures is as critical as protecting the species overall, not to mention how each subculture greatly impacts other species around them and the ecosystem as well. So, how can you can you comment at all on how the kind of cultural recognition within non-humans is changing kind of conservation approaches and where we are in that transition? Mm-hmm. And I, I think I like your last word there, transition. It is a transition. Mm. And, and 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 things are changing. You know, at the moment there's a big emphasis on this. So let me start why we would want to do it. What, why should we bring conservation uh, uh, culture into a consideration of conservation? Well, one reason is that what you know, one thing we're trying to do in conservation is preserve biodiversity, right? So the, the different things that the creatures or plants or fun, whatever it is do or are. So and uh, so we want to preserve that diversity we will want to preserve the potential for that diversity so that if for instance if the climate changes then uh, a species which has more diverse behavior or the potential for more diverse behavior is likely to be more robust than the one that doesn't and uh, so there, there is an argument because culture is a determinant of biodiversity that we should try and make sure that the range of of behavior that's that, that, that's culturally transmitted is as great as possible and that we don't lose it. So for instance, it's been suggested, well, when populations get very small, we tend to see a reduction in genetic diversity. And that's a you know, cause for concern because it means there's less genes around, less they're less able to deal with sudden changes because there's and so that's a reason why conservation biologists try and keep the numbers up there. You know, in addition to the fact that having more around prevents accidental extinction. But the same is potentially true, or, well, it is true of culture. 
So if you look at the cultural diversity of different human groups, those which are smallest and most isolated tend to have the least diverse cultures. And it's not because these, these groups of people are stupider or anything like that. It's if you have a small group cut off from others, then things are forgotten, things don't become necessary for a bit and aren't part of the thing, they don't come back in. So the Tasmanians cut off from mainland Australia for thousands of years, ended up with a much more restricted culture than the Aboriginals living on the main part of Australia. And, and, and it's been suggested that the same has happened with the whales, that whaling reduced the populations of some whales down to very small numbers, you know, 100 or less in some cases. And the suggestion is that when that happened, not only was the genetic diversity lost, but a lot of the information that those original whales used to lead productive lives went as well. And, and, and so, for instance, you've got a species like the North Atlantic right whale, who lives here off, off this coast, who traditionally had a patchwork of what they called grounds where they would go to feed. The numbers are heavily reduced, and it looks like the number of grounds they use also was heavily reduced. And that means as the climate changes, this ground doesn't become good, they've got fewer potential places to go, and they're not doing very well. Now, that's not the only reason they're doing badly, but that's, that, that's certainly out there as one of them. So that's a very good reason, I think, why we should try and protect the most, you know, the diversity of culture that lies within the animals. Uh, and, 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 and there are other uh, things linked to that. This doesn't really apply much to the whales, but it certainly does apply to a lot of terrestrial species. It's been shown for quite a number of species that if, you know, if they're wiped out or nearly wiped out from an area and you reintroduce them from another area or from zoos or whatever, if they don't have the knowledge of how to operate in, in that area, they're often in bad shape. Whereas if you can just get them that knowledge in some way, if there's one individual left from the original population or one older one you can put back who remembers, or humans kind of know what they should be doing and fate and you know and, and and trick them into doing it, like like the people who lead um, the whooping cranes or ultralight aircraft, showing them the migration routes, and then they can learn from each other after that. So getting the culture right in reintroduction and translocation is is really important. Can I and, can I um, re, can I repeat back that last yeah, sure. point to make sure I'm processing right and and make sure our listeners are too. So let's just take a hypothetical. Let's say let's stick with sperm whales since you yeah. know the species so well. So let's say there's two genetically almost like pretty much identical group groups of sperm whales in two different adjacent bodies of water. So let's call them mm -hmm. you know place A and place B. Is, is kind of what you're saying is in a this is what this is what could go wrong if we don't protect cultures within these species. Let's say whaling kills the sperm whales in place A. And after that, climate change forces the sperm whales in place B to have to migrate to place A. But yeah. they don't have the different places have different environments, different conditions. They don't there it's gonna take them a long time to learn how to adapt to place A, and maybe it doesn't happen fast enough to allow them to thrive. Whereas if that those whales that didn't, that they weren't whaled, that were still in place A, they could learn from observing them. Is that kind of a That's kind example? of it. And in, in fact, there's a, a particularly, you know, uh, good example of that for sperm whales. Those two clans I was talking about, if you remember, the regular click, 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 and mm -hmm. the last one, click, 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 click. We, we, we can measure their feeding success by watching their, their poops, their defecation, right? Because we can't watch them feeding a thousand meters down on the squid, but on the basis of the, what went in, what went out must have gone in, you count the poops. And so you get an idea of their feeding success. Now in the Galapagos Islands, the Galapagos Islands is, is strongly affected every few years by El Nino, where the waters in, in the eastern tropical Pacific warm up a lot. And it's bad for everything in the area, in, in, in the marine world. So pretty much everything in the ocean has a really bad time of it. 
a lot of stuff die. And we have measured the feeding success of the different clans in the different years. And in, 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 in normal years of the Galapagos, which is for a place on the equator fairly cool because of upwelling, the waters come up from the deep and a lot of productivity, then the, they, they, we see quite a lot of brown patches behind all of them, but more behind the, the regular clan, the click, click, click. But in El Nino years, very few brown patches from anyone and almost none from the regular ones. But the plus one ones, who were, were the less good ones in normal years, actually do quite a bit better than the regular ones. So they're diminished, but only by a little bit. So this means that the two clans ha, you know, respond differentially to, 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 to the environment, and the environment's changing. So it, if the environment becomes more like El Nino, which seems quite likely, that diversity that we find is really important. Are there any, right now, are there any more progressive kind of culturally focused conservation efforts that you know of, whether it be oceanic or terrestrial species that come to mind where it's like, this is a model that is sort of where we want things to head? Or is it still just too early and everyone is kind of in the beginning of this transition that's working in conservation biology? Well, it, it, it's mostly in the transition, but there are a few cases where things have, you know, you know uh, have happened. The, the, the translocation, relocation people have recognized this for quite some time. And they've been, you know, doing things like trying to train the animals to, who are being released into behave appropriately, either by having experienced members or humans you know doing something fake which gets them to behave properly and then they can pass it on but the the the, the, the case which grabbed me was that of the killer whales the killer whales of, of the uh, northwest part of uh, north america of mainly washington state british columbia alaska and uh, those killer whales again have a segregated society in fact even more segregated than the, 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 the sperm whale clans. And uh, the differences between them are highly are cultural. And they, they lead very different lives, these different kinds of sperm whales. And so the question is what you do. Some of these groups are heavily threatened. So there's a, a group called the Southern Residents who hang out particularly in the waters between Seattle, Vancouver, and Victoria. And they, they have a have been doing very poorly for a number of reasons, but probably mainly because they, their preferred culturally determined food is, is Chinook salmon, and Chinook salmon aren't doing too, good, too well. But also, you know, they're living in a fairly urban environment and, and so on. Whereas there are other groups, there's not a group called the offshores who stay further offshore and eat deep water sharks who, who are probably doing quite a bit better. And so, in both the United States and Canada, there was consideration of what do we do about this? And in the early 2000s, the Canadian group who, uh, well, it's part of a, the government who set up the conservation, who do, who do the assessments for conservation, decided that these were separate groups of killer whales and they should be, they, they should be assessed separately. So the highly threatened southern residents they thought should be endangered whereas the, the offshores would be at a lower level of concern, special concern. And, and that's what, what the Canadian government did. It, it listed them separately. In the US, they had the same issue, slightly different laws and regulations, but initially they said, no, we're gonna lump them all together and because we don't really believe in culture. And, and, and of course that lower, you know, meant because there were, they all got lumped with the ones who were doing pretty well because they were the most of them. And so that lowered the level of protection to the uh, Southern residents and, and the other groups who, who, who were in bad shape. But after a few years, the US reconsidered and joined Canada and did it the same way. So now those different groups of killer whales at least partially discriminated on, a, on the basis that they have different cultures. And, and, and I think that's really important that the Southern residents have a very different way of doing stuff. 
receive a lot of protection, whereas other groups who, uh, you know, ha have a lifestyle which doesn't put them in as much threat, you know, don't ha have, have somewhat less protection. And at least here in Canada, we do that for other species, for instance, for belugas. You know, some populations of belugas are doing really badly because, mainly because they were hunted by white Westerners almost to nothing. Others are doing fairly well because they, they escaped that. And so the different populations can be given different levels of protection. So, and, and the differences between these different groups of, of belugas are mainly cultural, not genetic. Yeah. So I, I think that <laughs> this is the part that I'm most involved with, that interests me most. And I, I, I think it's now spreading to other species, to birds and so on around the world as, as we think mm -hmm. about how to protect, protect them. The last point you made, was my next question. So I'll just build oh, okay. on that to see if there's there's any more to to be said on it, which was <clears throat> how do we prioritize our resources? Let's say within a species, we've identified X number of subcultures. But you know, we from a resource bandwidth standpoint, we have to, you know, say so we have to prioritize where we're putting the kind of most protection and most effort initially. And and let's say all cultures are some are, are threatened or you know at least threatened by you know biological standards what means do we go about or would you go about kind of prioritizing where we focus efforts and which cultures we we kind of protect before others and how do we make those decisions well it, it, these are very tough decisions there's no doubt about that and um, within a species i mean i think if you you know T take an approach of dividing the species up into into different units, and these are called different things in different countries. Here they're called designatable units. What do they call in the state? Distinct populations, I think, EPs in the states, and uh, more generally, evolutionarily significant units. And if we do that based on culture, genes, or whatever is the important thing, such that the information largely stays within it. So these animals are learning from each other. These other animals are learning from each other, but there's not much learning between them. So that's a good way to divide them. You know, or similarly with genes, these animals are mating with each other. These are mating with each other, but they're not much mating between them. Then, then once we've done that, we can look at the, the threats and what we can do about them. So there are, there are situations, I mentioned the southern resident killer whales, which have threats that we can do something about. I mean, we can we can regulate the whale watching so they're not too bothered by whale watchers. We can try uh, our best to keep the Chinook salmon stocks as, you know, doing well for the Chinook as well as for the killer whales. Whereas we would put loss, less effort into the offshore ones, eating these deep water sharks, which aren't um, threatened so much by fisheries and they're not as close to pollution and, and so on. So I think once we've done this, then some of the division, uh, this, some of the some of the ways uh, we should be thinking about where to put our priorities makes sense. But we do get real issues. You know, sometimes there's a very small population which would need a huge amount of effort to do something about. And the chances of success are very small. And there's a somewhat larger one, which has lesser issues, which maybe has a much better chance. And so, you know, that those are difficult decisions, which the real time people working in, in you know, in, in, in conservation on the ground have to make. I wanted to know from Hal what's next for him. He has accomplished so much, has spent so much time at sea, so what are his near-term goals he, as he sets back out on the water? Well, we, I've always been interested in the big picture, and the big picture is getting bigger. So um, we, you know, we started off looking at these sperm whale clans off the Galapagos, and then we looked a bit further afield, and we've done some more work in the Atlantic. And now we have data from all across the Pacific, from Japan to Chile, from Alaska to New Zealand, and a bunch of places in between. And so we're looking at how these sperm whales divide up their culture across this huge area. I mean, it's 
you know, the Pacific's bigger than any over any con continent. And to look at the cultural diversity, the way the cultures overlap, I mean, uh, it, it looks as though maybe the cultures that, the, the, the clans that overlap more, distinguish their, 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 their patterns of clicks, their, 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 their communication from each other. So if two, two clans spend a lot of time together, and then they try and shift apart. So they're, much, you know, they're very distinctive. Whereas two clans, one is mainly in Japan, one mainly in Chile, it doesn't really matter. They're not going to meet much. So, and then that's extending even further. We, we, we have a, co a, a colleague who's doing this for the Atlantic Ocean, and there's another guy who's doing it for the Indian Ocean. And, and so the pre prelim preliminary look at this is that things actually work differently in the different oceans. You know, the scales in the Pacific are much bigger than the scales in the Atlantic. The, you know, so I, I'm really interested. The sperm whale, because it's all around the world, is a particularly interesting animal, and the genes are pretty much the same all around the world. So the differences between them are cultural, and they can be, you know, small cell cultural, like do we do click, 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 or click, 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 or much larger scale. Do our patterns have a particular motif, like the regularity or the plus one, or do we say I'll do um, click, 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 and that's us. So these are these are the kinds of issues I'm I'm particularly interested in at the moment. And then on the conservation side, I, I'm very interested in in seeing if we can kind of regularize or, or or provide a guidelines for how we use cultural information, like acoustic information or migratory information, to come up with these divisions between populations in the cultural world, in the conservation world. Are the advancements of machine learning and AI kind of aiding you in the ability to recognize patterns, let's say, in dialects and language in particular? Has it kind of, are, are we seeing any benefits from that world in terms of the work you do? We're beginning to, yes. It, it, it hasn't got super far, but it's got some ways, yes. So, you know, one of the neat things now is that people, you know, our best route into the lives of the whales is sound. I mean, that's how they communicate. A, a large whale can't see, it's, you know, the other end of its body, but it can make a sound which another whale can hear at thousands of kilometers. It can sense, you know, over a large distance by listening to, you know, as the sperm whale does by making clicks and listening, or as many other whales do just by listening to what's going on in the ocean. And so we now have much better ways of listening ourselves People are putting these devices down on the bottom of the ocean all around, and they're recording continuously for a year or more. And so we pull them up, and we've got, well, you can ha imagine how many terabytes that is, or, you know, a year of listening at recording at very high resolution. That's a lot of data. And so these AI methods of getting the important information out of that are going to be increasingly important, and they're getting better and better all the time. Finally, what can all of us do to help? Is there anything we can do day to day to help Hal and all those fighting to protect our oceans and marine life? What's kind of one piece of advice that you know you would like everyone to kind of adopt in their lifestyle behavior to protect our oceans? What's one thing that you know? Hey, if we can get more people doing this, we have a better chance of protecting these magnificent waters that we really depend on and so much life depends on? What would what, what comes to mind? Well, the less we can put into them, the better. So even if we're totally landlocked, it's likely that, for instance, pesticides we put on our garden, at least some of them will end up in the ocean. They will end up in the freshwater systems, which are where, where they aren't good. They end up in the ocean where they aren't good. Plastics, you know, Plastics get blown about and float about and end up in the ocean. And then they end up in the stomachs of animals where they don't do any good. Noise. The noise we make on land doesn't usually get in the ocean. But when we get in the ocean, the noise we make does. And so, you know, when you go on, on the ocean, uh, as much as possible, use less noisy um, 
things to get around. So, yeah, paddle boards are great. Can, kayaks are great. Sailboats are great. You know, mm. uh, high speed motorboats, not so great. Mm. And so on. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, the less we can, as humans, put in the ocean, the better for the ocean. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Al, and again, thank you for the work you do. It's it's inspiring. It, I'm going to definitely link out to your book in our newsletter and in the podcast, so hopefully more people can can get the chance to learn from it. But and yeah, uh, just just thanks for the time and thanks thanks for for doing what you do. You're more than welcome. It's great talking with you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Till next time.